to um, James Fornak, who's a poet and a writer and a translator and also a publisher um, from the United Kingdom. And we were very, very fortunate um, to have James be the person who translated and edited um, the poetry and turning it from a translation into actual poetry in English. Um, so, and, and, and James is going to speak about the poems, um, about Fatir's place um, as a Russian language poet. And it, it is an interesting, it is an interesting moment to just hold on to that Fatir himself is Turkmen, but he chose to write his poetry in Russian. And um, so I will stop talking. To James, thank you very much for being here, James. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I really, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak very long because after I finish that actually do some poetry and one thing a translator shouldn't do is stand between the, the poetry and the audience and there should be invisible more than anything else. But I just want to say a few things that it may be helpful to think about the, the poems later here. And the first thing is exactly what Kate was saying, which is uh, why a um, why a writer from Devonstown should choose to um, write in Russian. And it's not just because um, not just because of the reach of the language, not just because Turkmen is a is a language that has more local resonance than Russian. Russian is sort of the common language for the former Soviet Union, of course. But it's also because by writing in Russian you enter into a an ongoing and vital dialogue of um, between uh, between the state and the, the individual, between the poet and the people against whom he is writing. So Russian poetry, very very quickly, I and mean, this isn't this isn't a class that won't be a, a test at the end, but. Um, Russian poetry, poetry in Russian, has always tended to define itself. The authors, the famous authors of Russian, Russian verse, have always defined themselves as figures who stand in an essentially an antagonistic, a complicated relationship between uh, themselves and the state. And this goes back to the the first modern Russian writer, Alexander Pushkin, the father of Russian literature, who was um, a radical poet, a, an aggressively um, free-spirited poet, and eventually caused so much annoyance that he, um, uh, he, his poetry ended up having to be submitted to the, the Tsar himself for personal censorship. Nikolai I of Russia became the personal censor to a poet. And this idea of a relationship between the, the writer and the autocrat, the writer and the figure of power, is something that uh, winds its way very, very visibly and very sadly through Russian literature. I think it's sad that this continue, that this autocracy should continue to have to be a theme in, in Russian writer. If you think about, and you start with Pushkin and you think about people who came after him, Lermontov, the next great Russian poet, uh, wrote a poem on the death of Pushkin, Smith by the death of the poet, for which he was punished by being sent into internal exile in the Russian, in, in the Russian sent to the Caucasus, where he eventually um, died in a duel at the age of 28. Um, there are, so there are, you know, 19th century monasteries, and what happens is that in the 20th century, um, power, by which I mean, I think, the, the state, the controlling figures of the state, just start to realise just how dangerous poetry can be to them, and I'll get on to you know, why that is in, 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 in a minute, but you have figures like, for example, Simon Schwann, who wrote 
one her uh, general who was a very unsuitable philosophical poet, she wrote one poem against snow. Um, we live unable to feel the ground beneath our feet as how it begins. And was denounced, was sent into exile, was um, eventually sent to a camp and died. And he spent his life, and I mean, one of the things he did was a very unworldly man, and um, very famously, he once said to his wife, um, What are you complaining about? Russia is the only country where they value poetry, it's the only country where they're willing to kill people for it. Um, and I think so. This is a continuous disrelationship between the figure of the poet and the figure of the state. The poet realizes that the, the state is actually an environment within which writing and living, giving as a poet, is extremely dangerous. But why is it? Why is it dangerous? I think the best answer to that comes from a um, comes from another another poet, uh, another poet Anna Hathi, whose son during the um, terrible years of the nineteen thirties was arrested and taken. Her husband was arrested. Her son was arrested. They were taken to prison. And much like I did with you, we. She didn't know what was happening, she didn't know what was happening to her. She was spending her days waiting for news of news of him going to the prison every day to ask if essentially ask if he was alive, ask if they should pass a message to him, ask if there's any way of being in touch. Um, and she wrote a very a very beautiful long cycle of poems called Requiem, Requiem that describes this, and it begins with a description of her standing in the, uh, outside the prison, and somebody, it says in the Russian, but I was now in quotation marks, so somebody recognized me, but what recognition might mean in this case, it means to be recognized her as a poet, and the person who she was speaking to said, can you describe this? And I thought to say, and she, in the poem, the, the one word reply is placed in a separate line. So, Magu, I can, I can describe this. And the last line of the, the poem, something like a smile passed over what had once been this woman's face. Um, and I think that is the key point here. I'm not going to say much more to the end of the to actually hear all some of some of the poetry, but the way, the reason poetry is important, the reason this kind of uh, literature is vital for our understanding of the way that these particular autocratic regimes work and the ways in which we can stand against them is because poetry by its nature is exactly what our mother says it is. It's this form of description. It's a way of actually telling the truth about the world. Whereas political language, the language of autocracy, is based on euphemism, it's based on lies, it's based on finding ways to to say things which sound uh, pleasant and acceptable, whereas in fact they are unpleasant and unacceptable. I mean the phrase that, I mean even without thinking about the vast amount of euphemism being generated now, but if you go back a few years, the phrase that comes from an extraordinary rendition. You know, that is a um, that's a very comfortable way of saying something very uncomfortable. And what poetry does, and what we're about to hear in Russian and in English, what we're about to hear this poetry do, is to say things with open arms. To say things that are true, to say things as they as they are, not as they should be, or as we want them to be, or as they might be, but as they are. Um, and that's something that I think that is poetry does extremely, extremely, extremely. So um, 
Thank you, James.